Hello, welcome back to part three of using uh, living books in your homeschool. I'm Kathy Sorensen, and I'm going to share um, some ways to use living books to teach the fine arts. Um, of course, the fine arts are probably best learned by experience. So going to concerts, um, to the opera, to a ballet, to musicals, um, sometimes watching uh, musicals on, in a movie or on TV if you can, going to art museums, uh, just, I mean, all of those things are just much better experienced, but it's nice to have a background in who you're listening to or um, looking at and observing in artwork um, before you go. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. And again, using books that we actually used in our homeschool. I'm going to start with art um, because I, I wanted, one of the things I wanted for my children was was to love to do arts and crafts, but not just that, but to really um, understand the, the beauty of art and especially certain time periods um, in history of art and to know artists so that when we were out and about, they might be able to recognize um, artwork because of a certain art, artist style. So the very first book that I bought, excuse me, um, was this one at our local art museum in Des Moines. It's called Come Look With Me. And I believe there's now a volume two by Gladys Blizzard. And um, I had never really experienced anything like this before I started homeschooling. That just was a part of life that wasn't a part of my uh, growing up, even though I took years and years of, of classical piano lessons and I was familiar with composers I knew nothing about art. So I'm gonna just show you a couple of uh, pictures here. She shows a beautiful piece of artwork and then asks questions. So it's gorgeous, different eras, and then she's got questions. I think you can see that there. Um, to help your children learn to observe what colors did you see, where was gold used, what, um, what was the position that the person was in, uh, and everything. And also, when your children get older, you can begin to teach them some things about worldview. How, do, how has art changed through the world, through the years, and what um, was considered beautiful uh, in the Byzantine period? Um, and then today, this is a Picasso, compared to, let's see what her earliest one is here. More, this is more from the, not Byzantine probably what 1600s 1500s but anyway you can see how art uh, becomes more fragmented as um, the cultures around the world um, have disintegrated through the years and how that's reflected in art and what's called art today um, versus what was was considered art art is an incredible gift that god gave to mankind and um I can't imagine not enjoying some of this beauty with my children. So that's it. This is a really good place to start for elementary children. There's a series of books called What Makes a Blank a Blank. So this is a What Makes a Van Gogh a Van Gogh, What Makes a Rembrandt a Rembrandt, a Degas a Degas, Monet a Monet. So there's um, several books in this series and it shows their artwork. This is Van Gogh again. So front, this is published by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, there's a little bit of text, the background to some of the, the work that was done. And they always have this little window thing. So that's how you could recognize them if you were at a book sale or a thrift store. Um, I obviously bought this from a library book sale, which I can't um, encourage you to do enough in your local libraries. There, unfortunately, as you've heard in my other videos have been throwing and burning books for many, many years. And it wasn't until maybe 20, 25 years ago that they realized they had a secondary market, even selling books at 50 cents and a dollar um, for books. And so that's when library book sales kind of came into a life of their own. Um, a, a nice way to introduce artists is, um, again, in, um, hand in hand with your history curriculum. So when you're studying a certain time period, look for the artists and the composers of that time period and then um, stick them in there uh, with read alouds. This is one of my very, 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 very favorite books, I Juan de Pereja. He, it's an incredible story from his boyhood um, 
uh, of slavery. He was uh, the slave to um, Velasquez, the painter Velasquez, I don't know his first name, um, who was the court painter for the Spanish king. This is late Renaissance period. And Juan um, was a faithful, good servant, and he watched, it was, it was illegal for Velasquez to teach him to paint. But Juan was um, very smart and he very observant, and he learned to become a fine painter in his own right, just by watching um, Velasquez and, and helping him mix up his paints and seeing what he did. It's just an incredible story, probably one of the most satisfying wonderful stories that I've ever read. So I can't, um, and let's see, the author is Elizabeth Day Trevino. Um, and so I think you can see that there. No, nope, one not to miss. Um, another um, author, Diane Stanley, there are others too. These, this is just a couple that I grabbed off my shelves. But um, here's Leonardo da Vinci. And of course, you all know about him and Michelangelo. Um, he's the um, early, early Renaissance, but the story of his life and how he came to be the incredible artist that he was, and scientist to some degree too. Anyway, there are several art um, series out there about artists, so if you don't find one, you can find um, others, I'm sure, in your library. I don't know if I have <clears throat> any others. Um, Shakespeare, I consider part of the fine arts as well. Um, introducing my children to that. Um, we did this in probably mid to late elementary and junior high. Um, I, I'm not a fan of Shakespeare and I, I freely admit that. I don't like reading his plays. I think it's boring and I know that a lot of people love that. So um, that's something else you know about me. But I love a good story as you can tell. And um, Charles and Mary Lamb were a brother and sister who rewrote all of the plays of Shakespeare, well, many of the plays of Shakespeare into stories. Um, so the Taming of the Shrew, for instance, is just a hoot when it's rewritten in a, a story, or Much Ado About Nothing, All's Well That Ends Well, Romeo and Juliet. All, I mean, there are, a lot of them are in here. There's other ones too. Um, there's uh, Stories of Shakespeare by Marchette Shute. Um, that is somewhat the same where she's put them into story form and they're just a lot more fun to read that way. So that was a way to get a little Shakespeare into my children without them really realizing it or it being too painful. Um, before I go to composers, one thing I want to mention, and I wish that I would have done a lot more of this in the churches that my children grew up in, we did a lot of worship choruses and once in a while I hymn but not enough for them to really probably become fully familiar with them and to learn more than, than one verse like I had uh, when I was a little girl growing up. So I wish that I had even spent more time teaching them hymns than I did, but this is one of the books that I use called 101 Hymn Stories, and the author is Kenneth Osbeck. You can see that. And um, this is exactly what it says. It's, uh, let me find my hand. In the garden, an old, old classic hymn, and it's then they write this. Uh, he's written a story of how that hymn came to be, what was the history behind it, and a little bit about the person that wrote it. So this is really wonderful and very sweet. Um, another thing that I wanted my children to bump up against was um, great music, and um, one of the ways I did that, I we had. Fortunately, I'm in the Des Moines area and we have access to the Simpson operas and so that wasn't um, inaccessible for us, but we never went because it wasn't something that we really wanted to do. But I found these books called The Story, maybe you can see that, Stories of Favorite Authors by Clyde Robert Bulla. And he, he is an author from the golden age of children's literature, which is 1930 to 1970. And um, all of his books are really, really good. So this is... Um, it's probably got 15 or 20. Um, there, you can see. So like when we were studying Egypt, I grabbed this. I, every time period, I just always grabbed this and we read Aida, which is set in ancient Egypt. And um, after we studied World War II, um, we read about Madame Butterfly, which is set post-World War II. So there's ways to hook even the opera stories. And again, it's not a lot the back and forth. It's just kind of the general overview story. But 
um, it's just things that broaden your children culturally to know about and be exposed to. And um, I know today that young moms really like to give their children experiences. And so this would be one way to do it. It would be even more fun if you read it and enjoyed it and then actually could go to an opera. Um, and I'm sure that there's many operas and things around to find. The next thing that I'd like to share, it probably doesn't exactly fall into the fine arts, but um, it was an important part of our day. Another thing that I wanted my children to be exposed to because there are a lot of references to um, things from opera, from art, from music, from poetry in our culture and in um, deeper literature that they would read as they got older. Um, and so that was to read and learn poetry. This is the, my favorite um, poetry book, but I, and I also like one by um, Helen Ferris. And, and now the name escapes me. But anyway, if you look, if you Google her name, you would find the name of that book. This is called A Rainbow in the Sky by um, Robert Untermeyer, I think. Louis Untermeyer, excuse me. And um, no pictures, it's just poems um, and prose, and uh, some you would be very familiar with and some you wouldn't. Um, when we were studying weather, I looked for weather poems and tied those into our morning reading. We, after we did our Bible reading time and our read aloud time, which was usually a history or biography or historical fiction, then I'd spend a few minutes just reading some poems, but often then I also tried to tie them into anything that we were studying. And of course, there's a big link between poetry and nature, so you can find a lot of um, poems to fit in with, with any kind of nature study that you're doing. So nice big book full of poems, rainbows in the sky. All right, the last thing I wanna talk about then is composers and their stories. Um, something that we thought was fun, this is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art as well. It's called Go In and Out the Window, and it's a music book. And it has all like the classics, like, um, Jack and Jill, I've been working on the railroad. It's raining, it's pouring. I had a little nut tree, home sweet home, home on the range, green sleeves. Um, the one about the mulberry bush. Oh, I can't remember it. Anyway, these are fun. You know what, I think that kids today, they're not growing up knowing um, a lot of folk songs, which would be another fun study to do. And just music of America and of our past, things that that you probably grew up knowing and you probably knew the tunes to several of those that I mentioned, um, but children aren't um, learning them as much. And I think in homeschooling, then we need to be particularly careful that we do expose them to that. So this was an easy way to do it. Since I play the piano, I'd pound around on the piano and play it. My kids usually um, danced or marched around or did something fun and silly and um, learn the tunes and the words. The next are a series of, um, well, I guess not a series, there's two uh, picture books. There's a lot in your library that you can use um, for teaching. This is The Boy Who Loved Music, and it's about Haydn. And um, it's a really fun story. It's based on an actual incident and um, a lot of information about 18th century Europe. Illustrations are beautiful and fun, as you can see. They would attract any child, you know, to keep their interest. Beethoven Lives Upstairs is a fun book. It has been very popular. I've seen on a lot of book lists. And this is a story about a young boy who lived, um, as it says, below Beethoven and heard him uh, pounding out his music and trying to understand the world of Beethoven. So lots of things like that. So probably you can just go, you know, online to your library and find things related to the author or the composers. This is, uh, these two books are from a series. This is older, but they've been reprinted by Opal Wheeler and um, her friend Sybil Deutscher. I think, believe that's how you pronounce it. And um, they've gone through all of the classic uh, composers that are out there. So Handel at the Court of Kings. And these um, don't, these don't go into a lot of their, um, well, you know what, a lot of composers, let's just say they, some of them had issues. So for children, they didn't go into some of those issues so deeply. It just tells their story, kind of what inspired them and, and led them to be so gifted 
and talented in music and interspersed throughout are snippets of their music. So you could even sit down at the piano if you had a piano student and play that. These have re been reprinted in soft cover and um, I believe they come with a CD so that you can actually listen to the music of this composer, which is a very, very excellent way to learn um, something that you can even do in the car. And that brings me to this last uh, thing. This is uh, Music Masters series. This is the story of Tchaikovsky. And so there is a series of the story of, you name it, composer, he's out there. And then there's also their um, greatest works. So you can get Tchaikovsky and then get the CD of his greatest works. And you know, those are great for car schooling um, on days when you're busy, or if it's just really hard to put some of this fine art stuff into your daily schedule, then you can do that in the car. And so I highly recommend that too. And um, you know, there's a lot of music, classical music that finds its way into movies and cartoons and um, advertisements and stuff. So it's fun to be able to know them and recognize them when we, when we hear them out in the culture and in the world. So just some fun, easy ways to teach your children um, about some of the elements of fine art. And then, you know, of course, music lessons, voice lessons, anything like that just enhances it, um, anything that you do. So Again, um, I'm on the Homeschool Iowa Discussion Group. If you have any questions about using living books in your homeschool, please um, contact me. I'd love to help you learn how to take advantage of such a wonderful way to teach your children. Thank you for listening. I'll see you soon. Bye.